introduce Kelly Nelson. I've been working uh, with him for a couple years now uh, as a dissertation advisor. Um, let's see, you got your BA in history from the University of Maryland. I'm writing, good, I'm writing recommendation letters from now. Uh, your BS in Global Affairs from New York University, and it was uh, specialized in international uh, development economics, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and today, so he's been, uh, he's one of the students that's been working with me over the last couple of years as we sort of built up some expertise in uh, patent data. I think some of you may remember a couple of years ago I presented some preliminary material on uh, using these patent databases for, for various purposes related to uh, some GS uh, interests. And so this is kind of the first example of a student uh, working on that, working with that data set. So I'll hand it over to you. I think I told you 40 minutes for uh, for the presentation and the 20 minutes that may earlier the remainder. Questions. But I told, I told him to aim for 30. Yeah, okay. But <laughs> it, it'll take some time, I think, to get. He's been trying to adapt this presentation to this crew, yeah. so, but it's a challenge coming from the We'll just start at the end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to be talking about, as Zach said, patent indicators, and I'm going to be looking at the impact of biofuels policies on innovation in the biofuel sector and also how it impacts the agricultural biotechnology sector. So what is the, uh, the relationship between the impact or between the policies and the innovation? So when a firm is putting out products, they can use increased uh, technological capacity in order to reduce their input costs. So the better your technology that you're using, the less of your other input resources you're going to have to use. And so when you increase the demand for a product through a policy, then you're also increasing the incentive to innovate technologies related to that project, to that product. And what about plant biotechnology? That's the next question. A lot of firms in the United States and Europe which are, are that constitute our sample, they are involved in both agricultural biotechnology, uh, chemicals, and also in biofuels. In other countries like Japan, it's different industries, but within our sample, it's per primarily firms that are also working in the agricultural biotechnology sector. So how does this affect their decision in regards to their innovation within that sector as well? So are we gonna see them moving their resources away from that sector and towards biofuels when you have a policy that incentivizes it? Well, I'll leave that question out there so that you have something to wait for in the rest of the presentation. And then we're going to introduce this concept called of spillovers, which is when insights from one type of innovation uh, affect other types of innovation. So you can, you can find out some key insight from doing biofuels research that also is useful for plant research. And so the last question is, if these spillovers are present, are the firms that are making these decisions incorporating this into their decision? Are they thinking about spillovers when they're innovating? So just a quick rundown of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about biofuels. They can be either bioethanol or biodiesel. Biodiesel comes from oil seeds primarily, uh, soybean <coughs> oil. Uh, you can also have palm oil and jatropha. Those are what we call the next generation biofuels. You can get cellulosic waste ethanol. But primarily, what we're using are traditional biofuels. You'll see that the, the biofuels mix, the feedstock, is mainly corn in the United States and Europe. In Brazil, it's primarily sugarcane. And a lot of these policies came about uh, in order to try to uh, incentivize the use of biofuels and transportation fuels in the United States. When they were first introduced in the US and in Europe, there were high oil prices, and one of the, the main goals was to try to reduce oil imports, so there was a bit of a political reasoning for this. But they also do, when you're, at least when combusted in an engine, release fewer CO2 emissions than your traditional fossil fuels are. <coughs> questionable slightly with the entire life cycle of biofuels, whether you're actually getting much CO2 gain or uh, benefits in terms of reduced emissions. But uh, Hockman and Zilberman 
did find that it was successful in reducing the oil imports to the United States, and it did actually have a positive effect on CO2, and by positive I mean a beneficial effect, a negative effect on CO2 emissions. Um, so the, the motivation, or theoretical motivation, for this paper is a discussion by Clancy and Moschini where they demonstrate that if innovation is possible, then it is optimal to have a mandate rather than a laissez-faire policy in terms of uh, the use of ethanol. So if the policies that are encouraging the use of ethanol also are uh, encouraging more R&D, then you can have an optimal social outcome from having these mandates as opposed to having no, no policy in effect. And as I said, it's largely the research in these fields is largely performed by these large multi-product conglomerates. Uh, Syngenta, Monsanto are some among the largest uh, firms that hold patents in biofuels. And so what's the connection? I alluded to this earlier. You could have an insight in biofuels R&D that helps with the R&D for plants. So if you're <coughs> working on trying to find a high starch yield trait for a plant, that can also be useful in drought resistance. So if you find the genes that control the amount of starch produced by corn, which we are doing for this, uh, it's the was doing for this one, uh, one specific strain of corn that they were developing for biofuels use, then you can also use that in developing other traits that have uses outside of biofuels production. And because the ethanol mandates have had an impact on global food prices, they've been putting upward pressure on food prices, when we think about the larger agricultural impacts uh, on consumers, if there is innovation from the, that's spurred by this increase in biofuels R&D on the plant side, it can mitigate some of these impacts by increasing yields. But if it's drawing away R&D from agricultural biotechnology, it can actually have an aggravating effect. Where it's going to make the problem of this upward pressure on uh, and food prices worse. So a little bit, I made a little flow chart. Uh, what are the products of doing R&D in biofuels? So the most direct thing that you would think a firm cares about is this applied research. Uh, what directly results in new processes and equipment for the product itself? But in the process, you can um, you can also come up with basic science insights, either basic science insights that help you in the fields related to biofuels, or basic science insights that are more generally applicable. So those that can help you with other types of R&D. And so this here would be where the spillovers are. Really so any kind of insights that help you more universally. So to bring it back into my economic wheelhouse. Think about <laughs> multi-product firms for a minute. And like it sounds, they are producing multiple products and they're concerned about their profitability across <coughs> all of their products. And so that means that they have to take into consideration when they, when they perform an activity related to one product, how does it impact the rest of their portfolio of goods and services that they offer? And so that's critical when they're making their decision making. Uh, so when the R&D is directed towards one product, does it have any kind of impact? Is there any kind of knowledge spillover? And when they're making this choice of what I would call R&D resources, how do you allocate these optimally? And when they're choosing what type of research to do, each, re each unit of doing research carries a cost, whether that's scientist labor, space at the bench, reagents, lab facilities, they, you have to pay for that, right? And then for each additional unit you're, you're, uh, you're uh, adding, you're going to get a smaller gain in output. So the curve would be shaped a little bit like this. So as you can see, as you're increasing output or inputs along the x-axis, your gain is going to be getting smaller and smaller for each unit. We call that dimension returns in economics, and because of these diminishing returns, you also have increasing costs 
effectively for each additional unit of output that you're trying to get. And a little bit about the data that I'm using for this. I'm looking at the EPO's PatStat database, and it's been established by some econometricians in the 80s that R&D inputs, the expenditures on R&D are easily approximated by the patent count for a firm. And since these data on patents are far more widely available than each firm's individual R&D budget, it's become very common and useful uh, way of measuring how much effort firms are expending towards R&D. And that is what I'm going to be calling a raw patent count. It is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a count of all the patents that are authored by inventors within a particular country. There's also a quality weighted patent measurement. Primarily it's driven by citations and also how many claims have been put on a patent, how quickly was that patent granted, did you file it with every a patent granting authority with the idea that if you file it with every patent granting authority, it's a more important patent. And so the six component quality index takes a value between zero and one. As you can see, a lot of patents aren't that great by this quality metric. <laughs> <laughs> and because our the the motivating theoretical model is a firm's profit maximization, we're going to limit this to looking at the R&D done by private firms, and we're going to exclude universities and government. We recognize the importance of that, but <laughs> for the purpose of our research question, we are looking primarily at what the private firms do. So just a quick rundown of what kind of uh, patents are we looking at. We're primarily looking at chemistry patents and a, which is basic human necessities, and this is the subfield for agricultural development. And these are the high patenting countries in green. Yes? Uh, I'm going to ask you a question because I think it's be useful for other people to get the answer. <laughs> what, are the, what are those codes? Can you explain briefly what those codes in the previous screen are? <coughs> what did IPC? Oh, sorry. IPCs are internet, international patent category codes, classification codes. And so the prefixes here say, in general, uh, what kind of technology is this? What's the best way of classifying what your, your process or your device does? And so these would be primarily chemical processes. This can be different, uh, different methods of developing new types of plants. Did you have a question? No. And so later when we're doing our, uh, when we're breaking down the impact statistically, we're going to be using these as biofuels and these as plants. So we're going to be running our models separately for those. And here's where a lot of the patenting is happening. Uh, Germany, the United States are definitely the leaders in biofuels patenting. Brazil is up there. Uh, because they are also one of the largest consumers of biofuels due to their abundant sugarcane production now. That wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> okay. And this is the quality weighted. It tends to track pretty closely with the raw patent count. Because as you saw, the average patent isn't very high in terms of its quality weight. But what we're using this, the quality weighted patents to measure is output. So we think about the raw counts as a good metric for expenditures. And this quality weighted patent count, it correlates really well with the actual value added to a firm, so the stock price, for instance. And so we think about this as, what did your research actually do? What kind of policies are we considering? The, the biggest one is the one candidate. So if you guys have gone to a gas station, you see may contain 5% ethanol. Generally goes up about up to 10. There are 
places like Brazil where they do have even higher concentrations of ethanol and special motors that can run on that. Uh, Biodiesel blend mandates are just the equivalent for countries that use diesel cars instead of gasoline cars. And then there's a generic blend mandate, and then in all these cases we tried to make it how the effective blend mandate, and so we weighted them all by the percentage of transportation fuel that was either gasoline or diesel, because if you could have a 100% ethanol blend mandate, but if none of your cars run on gasoline, that's not very relevant. And then there's other policies. We look at tax incentives, R&D subsidies, so R&D ex expenditures that are primarily going to universities and the government to see if that carries over at all to the private sector, producer investment incentives, and then some other supply chain incentives, like intermediate supplier incentive, feedstock production incentive. The sustainability criteria is actually a restriction on what kind of land you can use for biofuels, uh, for biofuels crop planting, and uh, that's pretty common in the EU. We also included import measures, which I did not list in the other policies, but it will be in there. And we're go this is a map of which countries have the uh, blend mandates, and it's based on number of years. And so Brazil had a blend mandate in place for almost the entire uh, time span of our sample, which was 14 years. <coughs> And these are not, this is not a binary variable, it is a scale variable, so that it did vary around what the blend mandate was at various points, as did the United States and the other countries. Uh, yes. Does it matter if, um, <clears throat> if the biofuels are being produced in the same country where the mandate is, or if they're working mostly with imported biofuel products that have been blended in the borders? Is that, is that relevant? I haven't looked at the actual amount of imports that these countries have, but since a lot of these are done to try to benefit the domestic agricultural sector, um, it's primarily domestic production. Although the, the import measures are import measures directed towards biofuels, we'll see that that doesn't have a particularly consistent impact on anything. So uh, Brazil had the uh, mandates in place for quite a bit of time, so did the United States. This is the biodiesel equivalent, and you see Germany had the most number of years with a biodiesel blend <coughs> mandate, uh, more relevant there because their cars run on diesel, and the other countries did not have very many. This is actually not a particularly common policy. Uh, it, only 12 years, or 12 country years out of our 273 observations actually had any kind of biodiesel blend mandate, but we included it because the, uh, the importance of diesel fuel in a lot of countries. And then we have some control variables. The knowledge stock is another typical packet metric to include, and it's a rolling depreciated uh, sum of all previous patents in that country, and it's essentially done to control for what the level of status quo technology would be. And uh, we can we include a generic one, and we also include a citation weighted uh, knowledge stock specific to each category. And I'll explain what an auxiliary and focal set are in a minute. Um, the food price, energy price, and agricultural support indices are there to. Um, to gauge just the general market outside of these policies for biofuels, for, for energy, and for agriculture within those countries. And then environmental regulations, just to see uh, if any sort of environmental uh, restrictions, any environmental stringency has an impact on, uh, on R&D in the energy sector. This would be, if some of you are familiar with uh, the Porter hypothesis, this is related to that, where the idea is more environmental stringency will cause firms in order to try to get around these, not get around, but in order to comply with these constraints, they'll be forced to innovate. So our empirical approach is based on candidate models within the uh, fixed effects linear regression category. Uh, we have a set of independent variables, 
and that contains both the policy and the control variables. And then we consider each technological category separately on the left-hand side, so we're going to be testing each of those independent of one another. And we look also at raw patent counts and quality weighted patent counts. In the end, we looked at six different models. We had a relatively small sample size, 273 country years, where all the policy data was available. And these are primarily OECD countries. And our main method takes those candidate linear regression models and does a weighted average of them, which is called a Bayesian model average. And this has uh, been shown to have a better likelihood of explaining the relationship between the data than any individual model that's used. <coughs> and essentially what it does is it splits the regressors into a focal set and an auxiliary set. And the auxiliary set is uh, and systematically tested whether you include a variable or don't include a variable. And so in the end, we produced about 16,000 different combinations of variables that we tested in the regressions. And then each of those, the results from each of those is assigned a weight, and all the parameter estimates are developed based on the weighted, uh, the weighted results from each regression. And so what did we find? And so these are the parameter estimates are the mean and then the uh, confidence interval. These are both the Bayesian posterior estimates of these. And what we found is, so I'm going to look at the biofuels patenting first. The ethanol blend mandates did have a significant positive impact both on the inputs and the outputs. So it increased both the RPC, which is the proxy for R&D expenditures, and the quality weighted, which is the actual innovation gains from the research effort. Everything else is a little bit noisier. Producer investment incentives did have a positive effect on R&D inputs. But most of the other policies were uh, pretty noisy in terms of their, their, um, their estimates. They were not statistically significant. Now, what was the impact on plants? So we see a little bit of a decrease in plant effort from as a result of these ethanol blend mandates. So we think that it's possible, the, based on our model, the explanation is that the firm is substituting its effort away from plant biotechnology R&D and towards biofuels production, or uh, the production of R&D for biofuels purposes. But the yield is not statistically significant, but it actually was a, a positive, uh, a positive uh, coefficient for the for the quality weighted patents. And what we're the way that we explain that is that some of the biofuels R and D was spilling over to the plant R and D, and even though the firms were reducing their effort they were able to get the same amount of output using a smaller amount of R&D resources directed <coughs> towards plant patenting. Can, can you explain uh, how do you measure this producer investment incentives, like a binary variable? It, it's a binary variable. What is that exactly? So do, does, the, uh, does the government offer any kind of subsidy for R&D or investment done related to biofuels. Supplier incentive is the same? The intermediate supplier incentive is for those that are creating the feedstock and the, uh, the intermediate, the intermediate um, inputs for biofuels production. And here the import measures are, they're all very noisy, but uh, in this case we actually did have statistical significance for the quality weighted and it was a decrease. And I think one of the ways you could explain that is that because it's based on citations, your, uh, the import partners have, are citing less. They're, they're putting fewer claims on <coughs> patents uh, as a result because they're the ones who are not doing the R&D, the firms that would be licensing the R&D have less of an invest, uh, incentive to do that.
And this is for patents that are considered within both categories uh, by a plant. And so some, uh, some agricultural process that also is classified as related to biofuels. And this one, the outcomes are roughly similar to the plant patenting. They're closer to, they're, the outcomes are closer to plant patents than to biofuels patents. And we see again that the ethanol blend mandates uh, reduce the effort towards these patents, towards this R&D, but did not statistically change the output. And we think, again, this has something to do with the spillover effect from the biofuels research. And so what are some of the takeaways from this? Uh, we would say that there's evidence that effort is being redirected as a result of these policies, especially the, the ethanol blend mandates. And so the firms are choosing to allocate more resources towards biofuels <coughs> R&D than they are towards plant R&D. Uh, the biodiesel blend mandates had less of an effect on R&D efforts compared to the ethanol blend mandates, but a lot of that could be due to the fact that there are so few observations of, of biodiesel blend mandates that it's just a, it's a rare policy compared to the ethanol blend mandates. And so it just might be an a artifact of, the, of how few observations there are. You just don't get a very good estimate of what the true effect is. Uh, so the findings do support the spillover presence, but firms are not increasing their effort across categories to take advantage of this. So one would think if there's spillovers and you increase one, and it makes all of your all of your resources directed towards a different <coughs> category more uh, more beneficial, so you get more yield per per unit of input. You would think you might want to increase all of your uh, all of your effort at the same time in order to get to, to maximize the total outcome, the output. But because of this pullover effects, that mitigates this, uh, this uh, the, the decision that firms are making to substitute their effort. And that's not hurting the output of agricultural biotech as much as it would if this spillover effect was not present. And another thing is if we ran this model with the lag on the policies, a couple years after the policies were into, in effect, you actually see them reverse and you see a, the, where their effort is being applied and you see an increase in effort towards the agricultural biotech and an increase in biofuels. So the explanation for that is once the policy has gone into effect, you got your production technology in place, you're trying to meet those policies, you're trying to meet that increased demand at, the exact time that you need to. And then once you've already got all of your your technologies in place, all of your processes in place, then you can go and start doing research on your other products. So the producer investment incentives, we saw that was one that was statistically significant in increasing the output and could be because it's a more direct reduction in cost for R&D inputs. So it's subsidizing uh, investment in general, and we consider R&D portfolio investment, or uh, R&D part of an investment portfolio. So it's one of the things you can invest your money in. Uh, the government expenditures were useful in increasing the patent counts for public institutions. So when we looked, we had, so all of this has been only the private firms. We did look to see is it impacting anything. We looked, we ran it again with the non-commercial, and it was uh, having a positive effect on those patents. So it's possible that it's not impacting the private sector patents because some of their research is getting crowded out by the fact that these technologies are getting patented by the public sector. And the import measures decreased the quality weighted output in one case but didn't uh, impact the raw patent counts, so it increased. It, I think that that could have something to do with claims and citations by the firms that would be exporting to these countries. But now that you know, since that's been reduced, they have less of an incentive to to use the technology that these other firms have produced. And the auxiliary variables. So this is the 
the environmental stringency, I did not put these up uh, because the it, it produces a completely different type of output. Uh, and so I'm just going to talk about them qualitatively. Uh, only the transportation tax revenue impacted anything. It only impacted RPC and biofuels. All the other environmental stringency indicators that we had didn't have an impact statistically on any of the uh, any of the categories that we considered. And so that finding suggests that it doesn't you know, unambiguously spur innovation. And again, we can't say that it necessarily does not, just that in our, our test, it was not statistically significant. So it doesn't confirm or reject or report our hypothesis, really. And um, another interesting thing that we found was that when we looked at these IPC-specific knowledge stocks, uh, there is a little bit of cross-category impact. And that could be another suggestion, or another thing that suggests that these spillovers are present, is that the, the average status quo technology within a country in one category is actually impacting another. So uh, the conclusion is that while the policies have been effective in spurring innovation within biofuels, uh, they have had a, uh, at least in the short run, they were not reducing the output, but they were reducing the effort towards plant and BP bio plant. So firms are shifting their timing in response to these policies, and even though the spillovers are present, this hasn't it, this hasn't encouraged effort towards R and D outside of the biofuels, uh, outside of biofuels technologies. And then all the other non-ethanol blend mandate policies, kind of a mixed bag. Most of them were not particularly effective in impacting innovation. Thank you. <laughs> wow, he was within 30 seconds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Special price. <laughs> so you can call in people. Yes. I have a comment, a suggestion, and a question. And they'll move in a gradient from things I'm sure about to things I'm really unclear about, <laughs> as you might expect. So the comment is that just I just want to give you some praise for the way that you present. I think we don't do that enough when we have when we give comments in our colloquia, and um, you're very clear. You pronounce your words, and this is especially important because if you think about what you accomplished in this talk here, you were explaining <clears throat> not just your results and the experimental design, but also some of the basic principles of your field to an audience which composes people from all sorts of different fields. So I think that's really important and something to think about, right? How do we explain the methods of our fields in ways that are explanatory? <coughs> All right, the second is a suggestion. It's kind of a question, it's sort of a suggestion. Um, I noticed that your maps, in which you showed us the pictures of the world with colorized schemes to show how long countries had adopted policies, that you used the reverse color scheme I expected. I expected to see the longest uh, commitment to a policy to be the brightest red color. And you had kind of the reverse, right? You had green. Now, you could show that. I think it might be on like slide 12, something like that. <coughs> so she, she did red, orange, yellow, yeah. green, blue, violet. Uh, so, <laughs> right, so this was so back up one, back up one from here. Whoops, and this is the, this one? Oh, yeah. So uh, the one before that, maybe? Let's see. Here we are. Well, I'm wrong. Color scheme. Color uh, scheme. So I'm glad I was wrong. But, but I do think that, that there's a lot of colors going on here. Uh, in different different sorts of colors. So Tuffy uh, has suggestions for you on colors. Okay. And then here's my question. If you could go forward a couple of slides, maybe to keep going until you get to your actual results. Here we go. Okay, here's the question. Um, policy impacts, what, what I think you're claiming in here is that there's a direct causal relationship between ethanol blend mandates and the number of patents that companies took out. Am I right? Yes. Okay. So here's the question. How, come, how do you know that, that it's not just a correlation? I mean, for example, what if companies had been working on uh, ethanol, various kinds of ethanol um, technologies? And then the mandates happened while they were working on it anyway, and they went ahead and patented this stuff that they've been working on for five years. 
So you might, you're arguing possibly that these firms are working on these patents and may have had a hand in, in getting these policies so they could use those patents? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a, a dark and nefarious and positive response, yeah. <laughs> but, or a practical one. But, I mean, but I'm thinking more about just timing and randomness here. I mean, the, the assertion you were making, I think, in this, in this slide is there's a direct causal relationship between policy and company response in the form of patenting. Maybe what would help me is to know how long it takes companies to do these, this kind of research and to figure out if you can actually establish. Maybe a qualitative response here might actually be as helpful as a quantitative one. So patents tend to be uh, optimally released immediately when you plan to use it, or immediately before you plan to use that technology. Because when you patent something, it becomes, uh, goes out to the public and you can alert your competitors to what you think is going to be a viable product on the market. Or, so if you were not planning on immediately using it, and all you're, all you're doing is kind of giving away what you, where you think the market is going. And so optimally, uh, patents are released when, they're planned, when firms are planning to use them. And so. OK, I see that. But what, what about how long it takes to do the research? Because <clears throat> a company has to decide to start doing the research, right? And, then it, and that is what I think you're asserting happens when you get the mandate. It's the decision to begin research, not the decision to release the patent, right? If it's a causal relationship, then if I understand this correctly, then a company says, there's a requirement. Let's start doing research which will help us meet that requirement. Yes, that's true. Um, I mean, they're, they're aware that these policies are going to be going into effect several years ahead of time. Okay. okay well, that's, that would be another useful call. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, back up to uh, the slash? Okay. So your six component quality index, uh, and you're, you're giving us these indices relative to plant and biofield patents, and you're talking about their load. Are there is there any evidence that you know of relative to where these are higher within the realm of so, biotech? Um, because I haven't looked across um, all categories, I'm not really sure where the other where categories I wasn't considering for this study fall in terms of their average quality weight. I, I, I see these and yeah, it's a little disappointing, but uh, I just would like to know, are there some indices or some place where then we could check to find out where we see these higher? Is there anybody else that might be doing this sort of research in other, in other uh, aspects of the biotech industry? That's something I could include in a, a future version of the presentation because I do have the data to compute what the average quality weight for other sectors would be. Along those same lines, um, what about the variance around those um, numbers between the biofuels and the plant patents? Because I can imagine that there might be lots of plant patents that are like really close to zero, but a few that are really like close to one. And maybe since, because it, I don't know, and maybe I, I biofuels those, might be more, I, I don't know them off the top of my more head, similar, but, just yeah. because it's more focused. <clears throat> um, it is generally a pretty high variance uh, uh, average because it, is, it can be certain patents. It was a 2008 paper, so it's probably not true anymore, but I, you know, the highest cited ones have something like 18,000 citations. It's a lot like journal articles in that you know, the average citation for a journal article can be heavily driven by the ones at the top. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, you talked about how the, um, actually it was the slide, uh, that it was in the 80s when people looked at how raw patent counts could predict R&D spending. And I'm just thinking about how, you know, we didn't even have agricultural biotechnology patents in terms of like commercialized products yet in the 80s. And so I think of, of patents as fairly strategic and that firms may be using them differently um, throughout this almost 40 year history. And so I wonder how well can we map on the assumptions that were made in the 80s about this relationship to these next 40 years when life sciences companies take off and the biofuels industry is born. I mean, all, all sorts of stuff is happening. 
What, how can we be confident that that relationship holds? Uh, they keep revisiting it, particularly the speaker like this seems to do a, a, a new meta-analysis about every 10 years. And uh, they, they do refine, that's where a lot of these quality, using the quality weights are from more recent papers, but they continue to find that same relationship between their own patent counts and the R&D expenditures. Cool. And can I make, ask one other follow-up? Just, I wonder, so this is a kind of data that I'm not used to producing or analyzing. Um, and I kept going in my head thinking about, well, gosh, what if you could just look at corporate expenditures on innovation inside companies? And obviously, we have trouble getting that data. Or what if you could go interview people who are making these decisions for firms? Are, are there studies that sort of corroborate these results that are of a really different kind of data that you know about? Um, I have not seen them within the, the patent economics field. Mm -hmm. um, that could just be a sort of methodological blind spot for economists doing these uh, these in-depth interviews. <laughs> Thanks. Didn't you just say, though, that there's a correlation between the number of patents and the amount of effort that goes in? Yes. So if there is, so there is some amount of backing to this. It's not just a measure. Right? And Jason's asking you this question. I guess somehow you figured out there's a correlation, not from interviewing people, but by what? Well, so when you're doing the, I think the, the sort of intuitive explanation for it is that if you're doing some sort of R&D, you're going to want to patent whatever you're doing. Um, at some point, there aren't, there aren't really any valuable uh, technological developments that weren't patented, at least in terms okay, of the, well, maybe, sort of the modern If you sense. go back to the slide that shows uh, the curve, is it very, or that slide. Right. Is that the one that shows some? It was one that showed how many pat the relationship between the effort and the number of patents and then the diminishing returns. I think. Oh, yeah, this is that, right. So where does that come from? Um, in general. Uh, well, you, you or yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's so an this assumption is, that's being made based on what? Uh, so in general, it's just if you add, it's uh, you can you get diminishing returns from adding. Effort. So, in terms of um, if you're adding more scientist labor hours, then each additional increment is going to be yielding yielding less. Okay, but because in talking to some of the biotechnology companies that have merged recently, it seems like they gave me a very different explanation. That the reason they needed to merge was that in having more people, there wouldn't be diminishing returns, but actually in the reverse of that. Mm -hmm was that by having, I mean, it was almost like that spillover kind of thing in a way, that by having more and more people in your own company working on that, they would sort of incentivize each other by based on their own results, and you'd get more patents as you went on. So I guess I just wonder where the data would be for this. Well, that would, um, so in terms of, I, I agree with you, uh, in terms of just within an isolated effort towards one technology, you would think you just keep putting more people, more reagents towards the same thing that you're going to get diminishing yields from doing that. But if you, you know, with their argument actually supports the the spillover argument that if you have that if you're putting a separate towards one, it can actually benefit your your research in another field. If that was their argument for the merger, then that actually supports uh, my argument. Yeah. I, well, I, I do think that there are differing results and different things. I, I think NIH has done a study about labs getting multiple large grants for research, and as the lab gets bigger, the output, and they measure in terms of papers, uh, that there is a diminishing return. But there's the other thing of, it's pretty clear that the breakthrough things that come about, the larger the lab, the more breakthroughs there are. So uh, it's just an observation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I have a <coughs> geography question, um, and um, and it's a context question, so if it's you know off base, that's okay. But you showed us pictures of you showed us maps of countries with defined borders. Um, but I was thinking about globalization, and I was thinking about global corporations. So I'm wondering if you all in your field do you measure R and D as R and D of say Monsanto in Brazil and the patents in Brazil? So I was thinking about how you handle global corporations, global R&D, with the kind of country-specific patent process, question one. And then question two, um, 
you know, one of the critiques of the patent process from um, the political left is that countries can go get a patent in an amenable, and a company can get a patent in an amenable country and then use the WTO and use international trade agreements to force that patent agreement onto other countries. Um, and so I'm wondering if that factors in at all. And again, you, haven't, you didn't talk to those things directly, so if it's, you know, aside from your work, that's... So to answer your first question, uh, what we used were the inventor addresses. So if it's Monsanto and they have uh, scientists in different countries, mm -hmm. it'll be the address of the inventor that was working on the project. And if it was multiple countries, then we divide it up by way of the different inventors in the country we assigned it to. We could assign it to say if it's in three different countries, we give a third of the patent to each of those countries. <clears throat> And for the second one, uh, not, as far as sort of the political economy and, and uh, the protection of, of um, the incumbent firms, I mean, I, that is always a concern that gets brought up when dealing with, um, with, with patenting. And I think that uh, you, you can do that, but also one of the ways that we were measuring the quality weight is that if you, if you try to patent it in all of the major, um, the major patent granting authorities, so the USPTO, the Japanese, um, uh, patent office and the European Patent Office. Um, you're trying to get broader protection because you 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 believe more in that patent, so you're going through the process. Um, it's not really patent trolling, I guess is that that common term where you're just trying to get some protection for your patents. Um, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, and you know, in the production of ethanol, there's another valuable product that comes out of the, uh, the DDGs, the dry distillers grain which has great value to animal uh, feed producers. Did you look at the, the patent arena with that product that comes out of the ethanol production? Um, I believe that would probably be in the, uh, the patents, uh, the patents that were considered both agricultural and um, biotechnology. There's some process to, say, improve the yield of that byproduct. This might be a, a pretty dumb question, but I'd love to understand. Ask, ask. I'd love to understand it. So, in thinking about a spillover effect on on plant innovation, innovation in, in plant breeding or, or plant technologies, there's a lot of other things that are affecting the innovation pressures and incentives around plant technologies. So, how do you know if you see a change in plant innovation? How do you attribute it to the spillover from biofuel policies versus all the other things that could be happening around plant innovation. So that's why we included some of those other price indices. So the agricultural uh, production index, the energy price index, and the food price index to try to control for some of those market forces outside of the policies. Okay. So, but the assumption is that there's these sort of macroeconomic policies that are driving all spheres of innovation, but not other I'm just thinking about, you know, the, sort of like the innovation trajectory of plant biotechnology, which has its own kind of story that are is not directly tied to some of those policies. Perhaps is that possible? Um, I can I can think about that to see yeah. if there's some concurrent policies directly affecting mm -hmm. um, these uh, the ag biotech mm -hmm. that's not off, that wouldn't be absorbed already by some of the other controls that we had in there. I'm sort of curious about the questions that have been asked to you by this group compared to if you were giving this talk to an, a bunch of high level economists. <laughs> what, would, what would the critique and questions be in terms of how different they would be? Or are some of them same? Well, there would have been a lot more of the uh, theoretical mathematical models, and we would have spent quite a bit of time talking about those and about the uh, about the Bayesian model average process in general. I think the, uh, the it comes down a lot to the, the methods get discussed a whole lot more in the uh, in the. But would they have asked the these kinds of questions as yeah. well? Um, you'll get some big picture yeah. intuition. I would I would say uh, they're they're it's not that they're completely uninterested in that. <laughs> <laughs> do, I, do I jump in there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, 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 so, I mean, one of it's very interesting to me to see this, and that, this is actually Kelly's first perversion presenting this job talk. 
this, this job market paper, so it's the first time you've presented this to a group, right, if I'm not mistaken. Other than uh, Post, you've had some poster presentations. Second time. Oh, in Byron, I was just one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, the colloquium's a big deal, so. But uh, one of the things that I've seen here is that the general questions, like the one about causality, I forget who it was I think nice. So that, that question actually is almost the primal question for economists when they're critiquing this work, but they do it from a very technical perspective because we spent so much of our effort building statistical methods for getting at that question. And so we would have been really kind of drilling down on whether he's addressing the, the causal, uh, causal here. And in a lot of ways, Jay, you were getting into this too because uh, one of the one of the threats to causal interpretation of his results is omitted variable bias. So if you're omitting something that should have been included in the regression, um, and and he's actually that of all the things that he's doing in the econometrics, that's probably the most robust part of his analysis. I mean, obviously there can always be things missing, but he's going to great effort to to affect that to control for that omitted variable bias. What he's not doing is any type of endogeneity. So if there's if there's reverse causality that kind of, um, you know, the firms are innovating and then they, they manage to lobby Congress to get more <laughs> mandates, that's something he's, that's not in his analysis. And that was a critique, a critique he's going to have to answer probably in, in, in front of economists who are doing this work. So. Well, that's one, one question. So I, I think I'm getting a little confused about how you differentiate the plant patents from the biofuels patent. So maybe you made this clear and I missed it, but some biofuels patents include plant or are plant patents too. So how do you differentiate them completely? Some are just about E. coli or something. And some are so um so it depends on what patent classification code they're given. So that's I guess you can have more than one and I do have a separate category for those that are listed as both. Okay, so that, I guess that's my but how many are in, in both? Because those are probably a lot less than the other ones. A actually. lot less yeah. than the other ones. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Because you know, there's two ways of increasing biofuel stuff. One is to work on a plant to make it more efficient at producing the things you need downstream, and the other is just to work downstream. So I would think that there'd be it, you could categorize patents in a different way that would have more of an effect on the plant itself. So, because they're closer to the plant. I mean, if, if you look at them, not in the plant. Okay. I think it's often. I saw Jason uh, stand up. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's, often, it's up to uh, a patent examiner yeah. how it should be how it should be categorized. Yeah. And so it, that it could be just an effect of that um, in terms of you know what what subcategory you put it in and um, whether you think that there should be additional categories added to it. Yeah. I would think a word search through a patent would reveal more about the connections. Than so the, the patent examiners determine how those patents are classified. So they read through the patent, they're yeah, experts right, in the yeah. field, and then they decide whether it's, it's allocated. And they can be assigned as many of the technology codes yeah. as the patent examiner thinks is, is, is needed yeah. in that case. And they're just, their determination is important because it, you know, it determines the legal property right, right. of all that's yeah. resulting in that document. So. Jen, were you raising your hand? Zach just answered the question. Oh, okay. Did anybody who hasn't asked a question have a question they'd like to ask before we close? I have a question, but not for our speaker, for you. Did you already announce next week's topic? I did, but I'm going to re-emphasize it. Well, good um, for you. Yes, I just looked at my schedule. No one else was looking. So, um, Steve Briggs from the Plant Science Initiative, I'm gesturing because he's over there, um, is going to be making a presentation next week. Um, this is a major initiative on campus, um, and uh, Steve has come in to take on a huge project management, management role, um, as best I understand it, um, and he'll be able to talk about that initiative, and we can also, as a community, think about the ways in which GES might interface with that initiative in important ways. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say, Steve? No, you summed it up well. Okay. Um, and I will not be here next year. Uh, next week. <laughs> I will not be here next year. I will not be here next week. Fred will be introducing uh, Colin Graham. So thanks for coming, and thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>